Hello, hello, hello. I haven't done a video in a while. Most of them are usually about games. Uh, this one, I'm going to look at. Uh, this is going to be a reaction vid. I don't, I don't want to, like, the first one I did was pretty bad. I didn't have, like, points, really, to be honest. It was, it was just a, it was just a reaction. Uh, most of the reaction that I had, I already technically had while watching Asma go stream. This one is DM Diablo 4. You know, you should know this guy. I really like him. His takes are really good. Um, but he is watching the Diablo 4 um, uh, fireside chat that they had for, that they were talking about uh, Season 2. Uh, by the way, I am a Diablo 4 player. Um, sadly, I have a shit rig. Uh, I don't make enough money. I, I can I can barely save money to save my life. So, yeah. Oh, well, uh, we're in the situation where my quality is probably shitty. I know. You know what? I know it. Everyone knows it, okay? But we're going to look past that today because, to be honest, it's about the takes here that I want to have and the opinions I want to put across. Now, no one cares, but I'm going to tell you anyway. But uh, I was a game design student. So most of the takes I'll have are from that type of perspective. I understand the intricacies of game design. I already know what you, you, they do before they make the game. Before the game is even produced, they usually have a document that pre that pre it's basically like a prefab before you make the prefab, right? It's it's something it's like the uh, it's a direction to to their madness in a way, you know. It's like okay, there's this document, and they follow. It's like the it's like a Bible for them, right? When they're making this game that they're they all want to make, they produce this game design document that allows them to kind of figure out what they actually want to do. And I'm sure they probably did this for Diablo 4 as well. And so that's why sometimes it leaves me puzzled that you know it almost seems like they didn't do that. It almost seems like they just made the game on previous experience, and they're still trying to figure it out. Which, you know, um, don't get me wrong, I'm sure they are still trying to figure certain things out, but it's like, why are they acting like they never made this previous game before? So, let's get to the actual reacting so that, you know, all any of what I'm saying actually makes sense. Let me shut the hell up. Let's go spot channel just yesterday so i'm gonna take a look at this haven't seen this yet i want to see exactly what the devs have to say about season uh, two i'm chris wilson production director over the live service for diablo 4 right. and i'm rod ferguson general manager of all things diablo so season two is going to be launching on, on october 17th and it's called the season of blood and um, we're really excited because this is going to be um a new vampire threat is essentially invading sanctuary and you know, it's kind of interesting it's the same theme as uh immortal which they just launched sort of their vampire hero, the Blood Knight, which is basically a vampire. And now I don't know what that game is. I, I, I don't play it. And I, I don't even heard of the game. I don't know if that's important or not. Um, but he did make a comment about the game. I I never played Immortal. Um, I'm I'm gonna look it up, but uh, probably after this video. <laughs> but uh let's hope that like all these aren't reskins uh well we already see that there's a lot of reskinning happening so i, I can only say that expect that season two now this is coming the diablo forward scan cool. so there's gonna be a new quest line uh so the player will be partnering with a new character named eris who's being voiced by jimmy chan so we're super excited to have her join uh, our really you know a great ensemble of voice talent and uh, she thinks she's going to be a great fit for the, for the game. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the character's going to gain access to new vampiric powers that you'll be able to use. My initial...
impression is vampiric powers. I wonder if this is going to be like uh, the caged hearts that go. And I guess we're gonna have to learn here in a moment. You know, I don't, I don't want the caged hearts again. I thought the caged hearts were bad because you had to. Well, no, the caged hearts were good. But the thing is, is if they come out with another season and, and it's something like the caged hearts, you have to end up giving power. You have to give up something that you can't get back. Um. For another, uh, you know, a new thing. And don't get me wrong, I, uh, you know, if the new thing is better, you would obviously want to opt out on it. But I'd rather them have integrated skills or passives uh, for every season that, you know, they can give the character so that the character can feel like he's growing every season, right? So it's like you're bringing something from the previous season to the next season. And it's not just like a jewelry or ring, because, you know, you change those things back and forth not only that but the fact that I, I was a little baffled that they didn't make um the caged hearts extractable because it's like it kind of defeats the purpose these uh it, it defeats the purpose of the fact that it doesn't make this how would i say it, it doesn't make it player friendly very it's just like they have to make the decision that this is what you want right this is what you want, and if you want it again, you're gonna have to go farm it again. And if you get the perfect, like a perfect drop, oh well, that's too bad. You put it in the socket. You can never, uh, you can never get it again. Or go ahead and farm your head off for it again. If you really want it? And I, I don't think that's good. I, uh, I think that's like a poor oversight that they shouldn't have done. They should have made sure that some somehow you could integrate. These caged hearts, you know, you can extract them. And if you extract them, it's like you extract certain abilities that you want to have as passives, right? I, I think something like that would be fun and interesting. Like uh, the passive for the Necromancer where you detonate, auto-detonate things. I think things like that, right? You know, certain passive abilities um, should become passives for your character. And his uh, ability list, right? And you should be able to like craft and turn those uh, cage tarts into a passive ability that is like a consumable that grants you that passive ability and adds something to your tree already. Of course, you know what the hell do I know, right? Well, let's continue. Moment, but if it's if it's like the cage tarts where it goes in your jewelry or something, could kind of be season one two point across all of the different classes. Uh, to take out the yeah, see, even he agrees. It's like it's gonna be just it's gonna be just season two again. It's just gonna be season one again, except uh, now I have to change the things that I previously farmed hard to get again. And we're gonna have to restart a new character anyway. So what the hell am I complaining about, right? To enjoy the next season, we're going to have to rehash our characters anyways. I, I keep on forgetting that we don't get to keep our characters. And I still don't understand why. Don't get me wrong, I, I, don't, I don't have any issue with it. I'm just saying that I think it's more player friendly. It's going to keep people playing if they can just play with the character that they played with from season zero, right? Not even season one, from season zero. Except they get to, they get to enjoy all these new passives, abilities, and they get to get the, the, the feeling of it already, right? His uh, malignant hearts weren't bad, but they just weren't that good either, right? That's my that's my idea from it. Um, of course, I didn't hit level 100. Um, I didn't pass level 60. Uh, I don't think so. I don't even remember, to be honest, because I haven't played Diablo in a couple weeks. So, <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't had the feeling to go back and play it, to be honest. It's a little sad. Because I just felt that it was just Diablo. It was just what I had in Season 0, except now I have to... Uh, now I have more important items to socket my... Uh, they're like different gems now. And instead, these gems fill up everything. <laughs> Alright, let me, let me shut up and let them continue. Yeah, the new vampire threat that's invaded Sanctuary. So we'll have new legendary uh, items and, and weapons, uh, new okay. uniques. And it's really going to provide a, a whole new way to kind of like uh, 
progress with, with your character and a new power fantasy. Yeah, and then from the, that's sort of the theme and story side of it. And then obviously with each season, as part of a live service, we want to do quality of life and make changes to the game sort of in the end game as well. And so one example of that is in season two, we're introducing five new additional bosses. Because uh, we look at, you know, what is the, the progress you make from level of, say, 50 to 100. And we want to have more milestones along the way where you can... That's the correct mentality. I think once 1 to 50 is the best part of the game, uh, 50 to 70 is all right because you're kind of pushing to the next tier, and then you hit tier 4. Once you can farm tier 4 and do Nightmare Dungeons, it becomes very repetitive very quickly. So what I want to see is these in-game bosses effectively be that, just that, in-game content which is, in my opinion, desperately needed. I also like that he talked about new uniques and new legendary items. So hopefully those are something that keeps with. It's not just vampire powers, you know, for the season. Hopefully that goes to the Eternal Realm as well. Me like okay, I think he missed the milestones. I, I do like the new legendaries. I do like the, uni you, the new uniques. Even though, to be honest, I don't know how can we be happy about these things because it's not like the legendaries and uniques are even very that interesting. They don't feel legend well i'm like they feel legendary because the world's already like uh how to say you know they constructed the world in a way where commons and rares are basically trash and what you really want is a legendary because that's when you start having any type of uh meaningful gameplay right right that's when you start hacking into abilities that's when you start actually getting a build down that's when you start actually caring about the stats um you know the more important stats on your weapons armor and stuff like that you know you care about that from the beginning but you know you're more uh you're more critical about it later on when you start getting when legendaries to drop and i think we need more targeted legendary drops for you know certain characters especially i think there should be build oriented drops like oh well you know this character is building for more of this because i was annoyed the entire time i was playing necromancer you know what dropped for me blood stuff blood this blood that and i wasn't even running a blood build and so i was i was running a necromancer minion build um and I wanted to see how far that went, went, because uh, Asmongold got me interested in seeing how far that went. And I was like, well, uh, all they dropped for me, all the legendaries that dropped for me were related to blood, a uh, blood build. I could have built a blood build, but I didn't want that. And there was barely any legendaries for my minions that dropped. And when they did, they were so scarce that I hugged them like <laughs> I, I hugged them like like freaking like they were the precious things on Earth. And, you know, I really I, I, I saw that, that I was doing that because nothing else good would drop for me. And it was annoying. <laughs> it was so annoying. And, and I'm like, why don't they have targeted drops so that, you know. Even if it's not the best thing for my minion build, it's something that's related to my the build that I'm doing and that the game realizes that I'm going the more minion route instead of the blood route, which it seems to almost want to like force down my throat, you know? Because all the legendaries that I that I would would get are useless. All of them, literally useless. I got hundreds of legendaries that were all useless, and so it was annoying. It was so annoying. It was like, oh well, you know, I can't even, I can't even use this because it, it, it counters the build that I'm going for, or it has an, or the, the legendary effect will only activate for a, for a skill that I'm not even using. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, well, how annoying, how, how great. Well, let's, let's, let's continue. I know I'm ranting a lot here. Like, oh, I can test my build against these certain types of bosses. And we also know there's a huge desire for our uniques and, and the uber uniques because they have a very low drop rate and sometimes they really you know solidify True. your build. And so now with these five new bosses, you can actually target uniques and you can go and you know have a much higher drop rate on an uber unique than you would in the open world. Those five bosses, um, obviously it's interesting because the way people approach this kind of stuff now is they're very... This is good, by the way. This is a big W. Actually, Asmon really wanted this to happen. He said it several times, 
that he wants targeted drops for uniques, and that they should be dropping off um, these bosses, these uber bosses, and that's where you should be trying to get your uber uniques from. Which, you know, I very much agree. I'm not in, I'm very much in agreement with that. That you should, if you want an uber unique, you need to, you need to get, you need to get down and go get, and go kill the uber bosses. Otherwise, why do you deserve any of those uber uniques? Because, you know, that's why they're called uber uniques for. Right? There's something to strive for. But, uh, and when they, I, I get really, uh, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting worried when they say, oh, well, it's just increased drop rate. Like, by how much? Because the drop rate was already, like, really bad. <laughs> so if you're going to increase it by 2%, um, not even 2%, but if you're going to increase it by, what, 0, 0, 0, 0 point, like, 9 or 0.2 percent it's it's not going to be much of an incremental increase and it's not going to be much of a of a of still it's going to still be an impossibility to obtain right so i wonder really how much uh they're going to increase the drop rate for the uber uniques that's interests me um because depending on this is depending on how serious i take the next season how do i want to actually reach level 100 in the next season because you know i reached level 60 on uh, season zero um i was like level 70 something almost 80 but i didn't you know season one was already going around i i work so when i get home that's when i start playing i have a shitty computer so that doesn't help much sometimes i have to stop playing because my computer gets too hot um so you know it's 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 a it's a myriad of things of why I didn't get to end game. Otherwise, I would have gotten to end game. Not only that, but it seems like I have really bad luck. So most of my drop rate is bad on a lot of things. So yeah, let's allow them to continue. Invested. So like at the same time as being excited, there's a level of cynicism towards everything that is coming out. So I saw the five bosses excitement. And then immediately people were like, are they just going to be reskins of a, a boss that we know five times? So True. I mean, people do perceive things mostly negative because D4 bad is the meta. However, there's some truth to the feedback, which is, look, when they say five new, they said five new and returning bosses. So immediately what people thought was, okay, well, are we going to get, you know, Blood Bishop again? Because the dungeons, there's a hundred plus dungeons. They said a hundred and something unique dungeons, but then there's like, you know, eight bosses in those dungeons or whatever the amount is. So yes, it's, it's, it's critics and cynicism, but also like it's kind of earned because there is a lot of repeated bosses. So I get why people would assume that obviously off the top of the head, I would assume these are five new in-game bosses. Like they're not going to do a new in-game boss and have it be Blood Bishop or the same guy that you have in the tutorial. I would assume they're new bosses, but it could be Copium. Um, my, um, I, I don't know, actually. Uh, I hate when they when they when they go in and they use this terminology and like it's like okay, what do you mean by that? Five new and returning bosses. So there are ten bosses, and just five of them are new, and the other five are old. Right? Is that what they're saying? I'm guessing they're making the del the delineation because of idiots. So they're like, okay, it's five. So that if they're the five old, they see a lot of five, uh, five of the old ones. They they don't complain. I, I don't I don't know. I just want them to make it clear. I don't know why they had to add the old ones because we know they're gonna reuse bosses again. They, they always do it. So I'm surprised that they even mentioned it and why they would want to do that. But whatever. So can you talk about like what those five bosses will actually entail? Um, it's a mixture of sort of like uh, new and sort of one of the things we heard a lot from players was like, I don't think we've ever even talked much about it, where the bosses are coming from. But there's a notion of like, uh, I play these campaign bosses and I didn't necessarily get to fight them ever again unless yes. I'm playing the campaign. So that's part of the inspiration. True. So there's going to be definitely like ways we can leverage content we've had, but also new content as well. That would be the best version of returning bosses. If returning bosses means bosses that we beat in the campaign, like Astaroth, for instance, you know, there's Andario, there's all these 
these different uh, bosses that we play through the campaign that we never see again. If those come back as like pinnacle versions of the bosses, in my opinion, these are best case scenario. That's best case scenario. Um, I think the only bosses I remember from the campaign are Ast Astaroth and uh, and Lilith. Um. Yeah. They were the only ones that I found like annoying enough. Well, actually, Astaroth, I, I killed him. He was easy. Um, I was playing a Barbarian, and that's when Barbarian was good. So Astaroth was, like, just dead. He didn't do really much about it. Uh, I felt bad for him. But, uh, yeah, yeah, let, let's just continue. It doesn't matter. And so that, but the fact that we're doing it in the Seasonal and the Eternal is going to be really exciting. And, again, that idea of, like, you know, we've heard a lot of feedback around the Uber Unique. So... And what's really interesting is that actually it's a boss ladder, so it's not like in Diablo 2 where you would just go and farm a boss over and over and over and over again. There's actually it's sort of prerequisites to get a, to be able to summon a boss okay. that you have to go through the bosses to get there. And so it actually has its own gameplay involved in even having a boss appear. What happens when something goes out into the world? When do you start to pick up on the general sentiment from the audience? Immediately. What is, the, what, is it data points? Is it social media? How do you know what the yeah, the sentiment is? Social media, so media. Service development. I mean, we're always paying attention to the community, so we're looking at all sources of, yeah. of feedback. Uh, we solicit surveys to some of our players, so we use that as one kind of funnel for for information. Uh, we look at telemetry and, and data that's like coming back from like you know the back end, so we kind of see like where there are pain points or friction. Uh, from just looking at data, but then also we're paying attention to you know forums. Uh, when we do a, a blog post or release patch notes, we're trying to look at like you know what is the response, where do things are coming back from the community, and we use that to kind of help inform some of the you know decision points for the future. And so what's great? I don't like the fact that they don't mention YouTube videos at all. I, I think they should be. Uh, no, no, don't don't get me wrong. Um. I think the, the 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 sources that they're they're sourcing from aren't really horrible. They're not the best, but um, but I think you know, listening to uh, certain videos from certain influencers that know what they're talking about is can be helpful, right? You it can expedite a lot of the issue, the processes, especially if um you know like twenty thousand people uh are agreeing with that person because they think that would be fun to have in the game. I'm like, that's a substantial amount of people. Uh, so, I don't know. Don't get me wrong, I don't want them to be like picking and choosing who oh, because they this guy has the biggest audience. But don't let's not let's not um let's not be uh, facetious here. Right? You know big pool um influencers with big audience pools that play the game also can be helpful to garner to garner you know to garner advice from them as well just just saying you know because you know these play, these people don't play their own game so that's why they're having such a hard time figuring out how to make these changes right <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna get to that <laughs> right with the live service is like between seasons patches, hotfixes, there's numerous kind of vehicles for us to kind of like inject change and evolve the game for the future. And it's always in pursuit of making the best possible experience for the players. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't know why, but I don't believe that. I just, I just don't. What you, what you guys have been showing is, is not that, at least. Well, I'm like, you guys have been changing, don't get me wrong, but, uh, Season zero to season one, it, it's an, an experiencing season zero, and you know season one is still going. So I ex I experienced the first like two weeks of season two of uh, season one. Um, so you know from that experience, I don't know if you really care about the players very much, but you did change a lot of things. Reverse some things. Uh, you fixed. You did some really good fixes. So I'm gonna give you, uh, you know, credit where it's due. But 
sometimes it's hard for us to accept the fact that you're trying to do the best when you're like, oh, well, the th changes that we actually want um, are relegated to three months back when we want them now. And your excuse is, well, you know, it's a little complicated. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, yeah, let, let's let them talk, and I'll get to that point if they, if they ever bring it back up. So I don't have to repeat myself and stuff like that. They will bring it up, possibly. So I, they definitely, I'll tell you one thing, is I know people will debate whether or not if they're executing properly upon the feedback, but there's no doubt in my mind that they are aware oh, of the feedback. I think that they see the feedback. I think it's probably uh, arguable that they are struggling to deliver upon the feedback at times, but I know they're aware of it, and I know that they know that they can't ignore the feedback. So you can call it copium if you want, but I think this season, give it a, give it a few seasons, give this game, give it a few seasons, they're probably going to address the feedback. I think the problem is they're, lo they're losing players. They're bleeding out players in the now time, basically. But, you know, give it a few seasons, we should have a, probably a pretty solid game at that point. Yeah, it's, it's one of the... I agree with him. <laughs> I agree with him entirely on the fact that they're bleeding players right now. And that... The way they're they're choosing to, the amount of time they're choosing to take to answer the feedback that they're given, is not the same. They're, it's not the same. Okay, it's not the same. So it's like, okay, how long how long are you gonna take to do what we want you to do? It's not or, or not what we want you to do, but what we kind of want you to do, right? Because well, no, no, not kind of. That's I think that's misleading. Um. We want you to change certain things so that they can be more fun. And you're like, well, you know, uh, hey, yo, you know, it's going to take uh, season three, mad season three. It's like maybe two weeks. No, no, we have to, you know, season. The big challenges is really around the idea of the vocal minority. Like sometimes a very small group can be very loud and that's why we use things like surveys. Like, cause you're always managing sort of the qualitative information you get where people's just opinions and then the quantitative information you have which is the actual data that shows what's actually happening. And it's in a game where it's sort of built on- I hope he's not going down the route, uh, the rabbit hole of just like, oh, well people are, they're complaining you're just loud. Like I, I've been fairly, I, I would say I've been fairly defensive of the game, but um, even though I'm at the point where I have to address like the concerns as well. And it's not just, it's not a vocal minority um, that is complaining about the game. In my opinion, it's a vocal majority. I think, I think the majority of the players uh, realize the in game has an issue in my own personal opinion. I think that there's plenty of people that play it casually, that play the game, but then those people are quitting the game after they get to like level 70, 80. And that is because they're a casual person, they move on to the next game. But the people that are still in the game, and the people that are still actively playing the game every day, I think... A 70, 80 generous, 50, 60 more likely. Because I'm in the 50, 60 range, um, and <laughs> I just don't, I don't want to play a game that wastes my time. I don't have very much time to give. So when I sit down and play a game, I want to have fun. I don't want to struggle throughout the the entire time I'm playing it. And 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 every time that I, I I feel that oh well you know I made an advancement, I get it smacked across the face. Because every time a blood legendary dropped, I felt like I was smacked. Like they just just smacked the shit out of me. And it was unpleasant. It was unpleasant to say the least. And every time a new legendary drop, and it wasn't for my build, I, it, it, it continued to feel like I was getting smacked, and that it, they didn't care about the, blood, the build I was going towards. The game only cared that it was giving me a legendary, and that I should shut up and accept the legendary that I was given. But you know, I had to do that, right? You know? Sooner or later, I got enough of those legendaries where I was like, well, you know, I'm not wasting my time. I can't even properly build the build I want because I'm not, nothing is dropping for me. From level 1 to, to 60, 
nothing is dropping for me. And I'm going and I'm farming dungeons. The only thing that drops are trash for me. I I can barely beat the uh the freaking challenge the the the, the challenge dungeons that you have to you have to beat to get to uh freaking uh three. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh world three, then world four, right? <sighs> Getting from tier two to tier three was the worst experience I had. It was so annoying. My minions died so fast and there was nothing I could do about it because nothing would drop for me. It it was so annoying. And I would target farm. I'd go into dungeons, target farm um <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> I would go and, well, I didn't have time, so I, I always missed the world bosses. And any time I opened the world boss uh, box, it gave me trash. And every time that I went to do the tree, the whisper, um, tree of whisper stuff, all it gave me was trash. It never gave me a gold, uh, gold box. All it gave me was white common boxes. And any time a legendary luckily dropped from one of them, it was towards a damn blood build. Oh my god, it's just uh I'm already I'm I'm already getting stressed thinking about how, how angering that, that experience was. And imagine a lot of people a lot of other people like me are experience, were experienced the same thing. I, I don't I don't think it's it's good. I don't think it's good. Okay? I, I don't think it's good. I, I don't know if anyone would agree with me about the targeted farming for specific builds like like if you want to midway change your build you can always save the droplets of of um other build of other build legendaries and the minute you start changing your skill sets to that specific build more legendaries of that skill set would drop you know because that only makes sense because why why would you want a bunch of useless legendaries? Oh, so you can get more more gold. Well, you're gonna get that anyways. Who cares? Just I just want I want good legendaries. I want them to drop for me. Um. Also, why are you making? Just take away the cost for for stat reappointment. Just just take away the for stat allocation. Not stat allocation. I mean, like skill allocation. Just, just take away the cost. Why is there need to be a cost for it? It's, it's dumb. Yeah. Whatever. We're gonna continue. I think it's a majority at this point. All are aware and addressing what the issues are. So I hope the the pushback on this isn't like, oh, we're just you know people are whining and they're the vocal minority. I hope that's not this point. Power fantasy, like. Everybody loves candy, right? And so when you, when you, but you can't have candy all the time. And so that's one of the hard parts about managing is that. No, no, I want candy all the time. That's the thing. I want it all the time. All, and that's how it should be. That's how it should be. I don't understand what's this thought process with these game designers that, well, we don't want you to have fun all the time, right? We want you to only have fun after you finish dinner. Like, no! How about if I want dessert now? And I want dessert all the time! Well, I think you should have the choice to have dessert all the time if you like. Rather, if it's unhealthy or not. That's your choice. But I don't like if someone's making the choice for me and telling me, well, Tammy, you're gonna be a good little boy you're going to accept it. Just, I'm going to be like, no. I paid money to play this game. To have fun. Not so you can dictate when I can have fun. Okay? We want to have fun from the beginning to the end. Not when you feel like you want us to have fun. Otherwise, people are going to continue to stop playing the game. 
Well, <laughs> well, it, it's already pretty bad, right? Like it's already pretty bad. So it's only uh only two K viewers right now on Diablo. <laughs> yeah, I think last um last week we checked it. It was like one point something K, so it, in it increased a little. But I, I want to have fun all the time. I don't want to have fun selectively. Let's let's stop this. Stop this trash game design where you want us to to like wallow in misery for most of the gameplay and have fun only a little bit. I don't I don't understand that. I've never understood it. Even when I was going to classes learning, I I, I always had arguments with the teacher. With the well, not the teacher, my professor. It's like, why would you do that? It sounds not fun. I always try to avoid it too. The word, oh, we're not, you know, trying to have fun, trying, you know, have a good game. It's like a good game is fun. All right, um, right. Sometimes there's a little bit of medicine and you need some sugar to go with it, right? And so as we're looking at our feedback and we're looking at what we need to do to balance the world because we want every build to be playable and, and we want every build to be viable. And so sometimes you have to sort of manage that across all the different classes and all the different builds. And sometimes you need a little medicine. And I think one of the things as we look at season one, we want to really show that we're being responsive and reactive. But the medicine, I'm going to push back a little bit on this because the medicine for this game is Diablo 4 is sick and it's sick from a lack of content. It's not that we all just want more legendaries. Like, I don't really see the feedback of people saying, we just want more drops. Like, we, everyone has enough drops, so much so that the stash is full. We don't need more candy. The medicine that, he, that he's referring to, I think, is things like nerfs, where it's like, oh, well, this is, you guys might not be aware of it, but this is what you need. I kind of disagree. Like, the medicine for me is actually more things to do. Like, the, the sickness that needs to be saved here isn't that we just want more dopamine. Like, we want things, we want a reason to log into the game. Like, that's my take. Active. Yeah, and the reason that you want to log in the game is to get more dopamine. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, this is me, right? And and when I say, you know, when I want to say when we want to have fun all the time, I, I'm also not, because, um, you know, he addressed it. We don't want more legendary drops or, or stuff like that. I just want to have more fun. I want to I wanna feel like, you know, because you mentioned it, power fantasy. I, I want to feel that way. Instead of feeling like, well, you know, if I have a shitty build, you know, I have a shitty build, you know, and don't get me wrong, I think that's good, right? You know, you have a shitty build, you gotta, you gotta learn, have a good, you have to learn how to get a good build, the class that you want. But, you know, I feel like for Necromancers, and when you're going for a minion build, and it, it's not that I had a shitty build, it's that nothing good would drop for me. I was playing for, you know, I played the game for about 50 to, to 60 hours. I hate the fact that they don't have um on on the on the on the freaking what the hell is it called um battle net they don't have the amount of hours you played the game so i can't even give you a figure of how long i've played the game but if i've played the game for more than like you know 100 hours at least um season 1 I may played for like what a good fifty hours of gameplay, you know, but I don't ever feel that you know I, I felt that I was like trying to earn my fun rather than I was having fun from one to two, because you know minion build is not it's not it's it's a it's a painful build to try and get and obtain because they've made it so hard to get it in the game. I don't know why are you making a build hard, and why can't I have? That's another thing. Maybe I should make a separate video for necromancers because I don't understand why they're so bad in this game. Who? You need to fire whoever came up with the idea that you don't want to main a minion build as a necromancer because that's the utter. That's the utterly. That's the most. Brain dead take or stupidest thing I've heard. Oh, you know what? I wanna be a blood mage when I'm a when I'm a necromancer. What? 
Are you, are you, are you, what? Are you insane? Are you crazy? I want to be, I want to, I want to lord over my minions. I'm going to have a legion. That's what I want to do when I'm a necromancer. I want to have a legion. And maybe we can have a, a better, a better lo logistics than what we do now with the skeleton mages and the and the blood golems because I think that they're bad. Yeah, I'm gonna say it. I think that they're bad because I think that we should have uh, undead knights that look cool. We should have death knights, and we should have all these like. I don't know. With 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 necromancers, we should have nothing but options. But it, it feels like we're constrained to this little system because of you know the little bit about the skills we have, or oh well, you know we have to balance it. We don't really want to do anything for this build because you know we don't think a necromancer minion build works in Diablo 4, but we still want to kind of put it in there. So. Yeah, shut up and take what we give you. That's how it feels like. That's how it honestly feels like. I don't know why anyone else hasn't said it, but that's uh, I'm going to say it. And that's how I feel that, you know, the minion build feels. It feels like it was kind of forced in. It was a, like a last minute thing because, you know, having too much uh, minions would break the balance of the game. I don't know why, because there's like thousands and thousands of demons. Well, not thousands, or not even hundreds. But, you know, there's a sizable amount of demons that attack you throughout the dungeon. And, I don't know. I just feel that your minions should be able to do all the work for you. You shouldn't have to do anything. You shouldn't even have to use any skills if you don't want to. Because, you know, that's the choice I think that you should have, right? And if possible, have legendaries that activate your passive abilities. Or some of your um, skills that you need to activate as auto pa and turn them into auto-passives. Like, 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 like the Malignant Hearts. That was interesting. Kind of. You know, because I felt that we should have already had it, but, you know... Now that you brung it, it was like, oh, well, you know, it's pretty good. I don't have to press the spine all the damn time. And I think you should expand the skill slots. I think we should have more skills. I want at least, like, six to seven skills to, 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 to use. I don't know. I feel that the way this, the, the skill tree is now, it's, lim it's super limited. It's it's so linear, it's so narrow. Yeah. I don't I don't know. I'm not, I'm going to stop. I'm not, I'm not, let's listen. Other than being agile, but we sort of got two thirds of the way there, and we had a lot of the medicine, but we didn't have the sugar yet. And so, but to, to yeah, be able fair. to act quickly, we sort of said, well, that's good. Let's, we've got the fix, but we, when we didn't bring the, and here's the other fun part that makes that balance work. And so I think that's part of the criticism of season one is that we did the medicine, didn't quite yet do the sugar, and then the, okay, so he's the he's not he's now. not pushing and back. He's admitting they're admitting fault. The basically. live streams is that moving forward, anytime we have to do any sort of significant balance, we'll always have that other side of it, like because it's really about you know we're making the game for player joy. We're making the game the best game we can for players, and so but sometimes they have to have a salad. They can't have ice cream for dinner every night, you know, and so you just have to kind of balance your messaging, manage expectations, communicate more openly. And I think we're doing that now as we go into season two. You mentioned it earlier, but how do you account for the vocal minority in a way that feels like you're speaking to them, but also not balancing that with the realistic? Cares. You should only care about the people who are playing the game. Don't get me wrong, the vocal minority are not not playing the game. But if they're if they're uh, saying that they want no more fun or, or oh, oh this is too broken, yeah, take it out of the game when it's not actually like too broken. Just filter them out. So I that's all I say. Kind of actually, what I say, and dude, um, 
because it's obviously like Diablo 4 comes out everyone's super positive and everyone is like really up on it and the vast majority of people are enjoying it but then the conversation quickly turns into like this is missing that is missing but that conversation is very much defined and pushed by a group of people that are at level 100 or 80 and they're the only people that are like really vocal right. so it can seem like when people are looking at it oh this is a really pervasive issue and it's actually just a small group of people i, I don't like i don't like that opinion um, I, I've said that I don't think most people are going to get to 100, but I think a lot of people will get to 70 and 80. I don't think it's a small group of people complaining about the game, and I think the people that are complaining about the game are the people that are supporting it the most, which are playing it the most at the moment. So kind of... I, I don't know if I like this line of, like, thinking of, you know, it's uh, how do we deal with the fact that it's just a small group of people? It kind of seems, like, dismissive of the complaints. Like, this is... Like, it's reviewers saying this... I've even seen like some casual people that make it to like 70, 80 and then get bored. Uh, the hardcore people are saying this. All of the major Diablo partners and content creators are seeing this. All of the guide builders are saying, this isn't a small group. This is most of the people who play the game at the level that they would want them to play the game, which is all day, every day. Like basically they want people to grind their game. These people are grinding their game and saying there's a problem. So I kind of, I kind of don't like this line of questioning. But like, how do we deal with this? Just a small group of people. Like, it's a, it's a lot of people, guys. How do you like approach that? I agree. I agree. Most of the vocal majority are people who play the game. Yeah. Well, he, he's already said it. He already said it. I don't have to repeat it. It's true. What he's saying is true. Why are you, do you care? Most of the vocal minority are the people are casuals who don't even stick around long enough cares what they have to say they're not going to stay anyways even if you make the changes they want they're complaining just to complain but the people who are actually playing the game are telling you what's wrong with it or oh this is what's missing or you sh maybe you should add this you know it might be more fun that way Or a lot of them across the board say the same thing. Oh, I'm going to bring it back to the necromancers. But, you know, I feel, you know, that maybe there should be a minion build for that, right? Like a really good one. And maybe it shouldn't be a pain in the butt to make a minion build. Maybe the easiest thing you should make for a necromancer is the minion build. And what should be harder to obtain is all the other builds for it, right? You know, uh, you would think that the easiest option would be would wouldn't wouldn't would would be the easiest solution, right? Instead, it seems the easiest option has become the hardest solution. Well, you know, for Blizzard to obtain at least, or you know, these Diablo devs uh, make happen. I. I'm utterly, like, baffled. And then again, they pulled the Diablo Immortal, so how surprised can we really be? And is there anything that you do to try and tell the, your own team, like, hey, I know it looks like this, but we have to think about everyone, and how do you message that out as well? Yeah, I mean, the, like I said, I think the quantitative data really helps there, so you can actually see what's happening with the game, and you can go like, oh, you know, this might be an issue for people who are level 100, and this is the percentage of people who have actually gotten there so far. And we can sort of look at how big of an issue that actually is. But I mean, but you should also should look into the fact that people aren't getting to level 100 because they get bored. So it's like, oh well, only one percent of people get to 100, but that's a symptom of a problem. Like if people aren't getting to 100 because they don't want to, then that's, in my opinion, that's kind of like that's data also, right? The I a uh, hundred. Well, I'm, done. I'm done. I'm stopping the video every time just to agree with him. You guys know that I'm going to agree with him anyways, or at least I hope you do. But I also feel that they should, um, like, play their own game. Maybe they would also agree with the conclusions a lot of people reach if they've played their own game. Or what they do is that they have a, uh, a level 100 that they play base off, you know, because I think what ha what should happen is they they should have end game level um, play testing and mid game level play testing and 
and beginning level playtesting. I think there should be three stages to this playtesting period, right? It should be 1 to 20, uh, 40 to 80, and 80 to 100. Why? Why do I say this? Because 1 to 20 is this it's just you know it's it's basically the 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 you're getting you're getting started because you're gonna be you're gonna be level at least 20 i think 21 if by half of half of act one i don't i don't uh yeah yeah by half of act one uh, or even earlier you, you can be level 21 and so you can get a pretty good feel of what build you're going to start off. And you want to make sure that even those first 20 levels are really good and really fun. And really solid. And so, once you hit level 20, or 20, you can even say 25, it's going to be the same until you hit level 40, or even 50. So it really doesn't matter, like, gauging from then. But gauging from level 40 to level 80, that's totally different. Because now you're gonna get in you now you're gonna get into your paragon board. Um, you know, after you hit after you hit 50, you're gonna get into your paragon board. You're gonna start seeing how you wanna continue the build you've already instantiated from you know your your level one to twenty play twenty-five play. Because I'm like that's what happens really, right? You don't really change your build ever. First, you get you, you first you play from level one to twenty five, figure out what you like, and then you stay you pretty much stick with it until end game, and so the refinement of your build happens from level forty to eighty, and then you just further it just further gets stronger once you hit level a hundred, and that's how it's supposed to be, right? That's what you're doing. That, or at least, you know, that's what I'm seeing most people do. And that's what I would do. But, but you know, I haven't made it, I didn't make it to, to, to 100 on any of my playthroughs. Um, so, you know, take my, take my, what I say with a grain of salt. Even though on, on Season 0, I made it to level 80. And in Season 1, I made it to level at least 50, if I'm right. If I remember correctly. So... And I kind of dropped off after that. Because I was not having fun. Instead, it became a chore. And if it becomes a chore, I'm just going to drop the game. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's not worth my time. I don't want to say vocal minority to be dismissive, because sometimes that vocal minority are also your influencers and the people who are, you know, the tastemakers who will be like, hey, this is how we feel about it, and you want to take that in as well. And that's why it's always is, is a balance between knowing what are we hearing and what are we seeing in the game and what are we feeling when we play. And I think that notion of like, hey, you know, we, one of the things we were excited about with D4 is that as a mainline game, no other Diablo game actually had any end game at all. Like when the campaign rolled credits, you were done. And so we were really happy with D4 to have Helltide and Nightmare Dungeons and the Tree of Whispers and PvP. And so we felt like this was a great starting place. And so when we when we talked, even if you go back to our interviews pre-launch, we would talk about... I, I think it's fair to give him the point that it is a good starting place. I think that's fair. I probably will get some shit for this, but I think Diablo 4 has good bones. I don't think it's unsalvageable. I do believe Diablo 4 can become a great game. I think it will become a pretty good game in a few seasons. I think right now there's a lack of content. I think once we get more content added into the game, a fix from 80 to 100 in terms of boredom, basically, is what I really want to see, then I think there's actually something there. And I think the more that we add to the end game, the better the game's going to get. I don't I don't think it's unfair at all to give them that point. It, it, it does have good... Bones. It is a good starting structure. The overworld's pretty cool. There's a lot they can add in. It's a little barren of a wasteland right now, but like the actual structure of the game isn't actually that bad. Like we get these new in-game bosses, make nine more dungeons a little bit more exciting, yada yada yada. We add some more things, maybe make PvP a little bit better yeah, as well. There's a lot they can still do, which I think is what he's trying. I think they further need to refine the classes a little. 
I don't know. That's just me. I think they need to figure out what they really want to do with these classes. Because I think that's the, the, the buttress, right? For further um, content creation. Because if they know what they want to do with the classes, they want to know what new class they want to make if they're ever going to make a new class. Which, you know, I think there should be a new one for each season that is, you know, um, that comes with the season, right? Like, uh, there should have been, like, a Blood Knight for this, this vampire-esque season. Um, and the mig malignant, uh, the malignant heart, uh, I forgot what the heck is called, really. The, uh, the season of the malignant, right? Well, there should have been a, a special class for this, for this and stuff like that. I, I don't know. That's how I feel. I feel that there should have been a class for each season and... You know, they should have, this should have been planned out way in ahead of time, so the classes could have been really done, and Season 0 was just kind of really a beta, a big, big beta test, so so that they can further refine these, these um, so-called beta classes that are going to come out in these future seasons, which, you know, I think would, would ease up on the... People complaining on certain classes and, and stuff like that. Especially the fact that they're going to be playing a new class every season. They wouldn't complain as much. Because they'd be starting with a new class. And so they'd have to figure out new builds and stuff like that. They'd have so much things to already do. That they won't have time to complain about all the other things. You know what they say, right? Play smart, not harder. Or work work smarter, not harder. That, that's what really is. it's just the is saying. You know, I don't know. That's just me. But because I, I do agree that foundation is good so far. Um, I had fun when I was playing as a barbarian in season zero. Uh Season one, when they when they finally basically gutted the barbarian, I wasn't having as much fun, um, and so I switched to necromancer. I uh, I had fun on and off with the necromancer, um, but I didn't have obviously enough fun where I kept on playing the game, even when they said that double XP weekend. I just kept on playing Armored Core Six and said F it. I don't care. So, yeah. Try and say, which is a true point. This is the beginning and not the ending of Diablo. You know, this is a foundation we're building upon. And you're seeing that, like, in Season 2, with these five additional bosses, with, in Season 3, we're going to be bringing in leaderboards. Like, those, are, this is an evolution of a game over time. And so yeah, that's all fair. That you can kind of grind your way to 100 and go, like, what the heck, where's everything I was... No, no, I don't think this is fair to be honest. Cause I, I don't know why why everyone makes it seem like this is their first rodeo. Like, oh, this is the first time they made an RPG game, so we can give them you know slack on the fact they don't have leaderboards yet, stuff like that. You no, know, the real the real reason they don't have leaderboards is because they don't want to expose the fact that. There's still so much other bugs they haven't they haven't uh, addressed. They still need to address, right? So much other exploits that the one percent are uh, are using to their advantage. And that's why we don't have leaderboards. And we have to wait till three for numbers and a list to get on the screen. Because to be honest, that's what the leaderboards are. It's a number and a list of names. And they go in a certain order. Who's the strongest to who's not. That's it. Leaderboard should have been season one. But of course we can't do that. That uh, might expose a little too much. So, yeah. 
was expected. Like all that stuff is being layered in over time as we go, and we're continuing to make the game, you know, better and better. So I, I think that's totally fair. Like uh, it, it's unfinished. Is I think a way to say it. I feel like the game after playing for a bit. I feel like the game is. Uh, it, it was released either a little earlier or it's a little unfinished. I think once it is finished, it'll be a pretty good game. And that is most of the sentiment I've actually seen from this vocal minority as well. Most of the people are, aren't saying the game is complete trash and unsalvageable. Most of the people I'm saying are like have complaints about like add these things into the game and we have something. I find myself to be in that same category. Add a really good in game and we have a pretty solid game. Because the one to 50 and the basically getting to world tier four and the campaign, which is fire, by the way, campaign's fire. All of that is good. All of that is good, enjoyable gameplay. One to 70 is pretty fire, in my opinion. One to 50 especially, so campaign is rock hard solid, okay? Uh, the seasons are a little lackluster. Add better seasonal content, add in-game content. We got something. It really is just sort of like definitely take in what you hear, but also, you know, trust but verify. Go and see what the data is telling you as well. In addition to that, it... No, they always mention in data. I think the data can say whatever it wants. But if you play the game yourself, you know, and you figure out if the data, what the data is saying is right. Because I feel that they look at the data just so they don't have to play the game. So they don't have to play test the game. Or they can overlook a lot of things if play test does happen. Instead, of, what do they do instead of play testing? Oh, well, we're going to refer to the data. Uh, it's like, uh, I don't know about that. Maybe you should stick to, like, playing 24 hours, 25 to 26, to even, you know, 48 hours as a, a level 100 and experiencing that and tuning your uh, experience and seeing how much you have to really min-max, you know, uh, or, like I said, you know, the sweet spots for playing, I think, is... 1 to 25, uh, 40 to 80, and 80 to 100. 40 to 80 range is when people will drop off if they don't feel that their time is, uh, their time is being valued. So, that's, you know, that's where pe most people are going to drop off. Um, most, and there's going to be a, a large number of people who drop off from 1 to 25 if the class doesn't feel good, or if any of the classes don't feel good to them, right, you know? Or, you know, maybe we can add this or that, or maybe we can take off the fact that, uh, stat allocation, or, or skill allocations cost money, you know, maybe we could, like, make them cost nothing. Because nothing is a value, by the way. <laughs> so you can't, you can't, you can't have it as a value in the in a game. Just saying, because you start off with zero of everything. So yeah. I think the other other important for, uh, piece of this is transparency, right? So we're really trying to create and and be open with our community about setting expectations, like here's what we're trying to do in the near future, releasing patch notes early, um, really just you know having uh, live streams, the campfire chats, letting our, our audience know like here's what we're trying to do in the short term, here are things we want to even do in the medium the campfire term, campfire like chats are good. Leaderboards for season three. Like we're trying to just like, you know, be more open about that information versus like holding everything to the best. I agree, I like the campfire chats. Like, you know, you know, talk chats. philosophy, like here's why we're doing certain things. Because I think it's one thing to say what you're doing, another reason thing to say why you're doing it. And so I think helping people understand like, oh, this is our goal, this is what we're trying to accomplish, and, and just give some background to why these decisions are being made. You know, you guys have been quite candid with, you know, the patch came out and then uh, some stuff, and you're like, okay, we're, we did it wrong, we won't do that again. Um, and then you talked about all the vehicles you have to kind of approach it. How do you feel about the expectation that that creates because it's kind of a double-edged sword right where you're like oh. i just want to kind of pause for a second so the fact that they came out with sort of an emergency campfire chat and said they're not gonna like took the l basically i was kind of happy that they actually took the l because it showed a willingness to actually listen to feedback I i'll be honest if they had come out after that nerf patch and just started 
being like, well, it's a vocal minority. There's not really any problems with it. Like, let me explain the flaw. I actually said, and I guessed, that, and I was wrong, that what they were going to do is come out and like, no, let me explain it. Like, it's really not a big deal. But they really just took the L, which in my opinion made me have a little bit more faith in it. And then they reverted some of the... No, I think they needed to take that L. Because if they didn't, well, <laughs> I think the game would have been taking the L for them. And... I think they had to, uh, I'm sure they had a meeting about it, right? I'm sure they had a meeting about it is that, do we have to take this out? I'm sure that's what the meeting was about. Do we have to take this out? And I'm sure a lot of the, the feedback was like, yes, you have to take this out. Because if you don't take this out now, the game is going to take the L for you. <laughs> like, we act like they had a choice here. Well, I'm like, they did, technically. But it's like it, you know. It's 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 a lot. There's a lot of technicalities here. You know, it's difficult, right? It's complicated. <laughs> uh. The issues as well. So like that gives me some more faith and gives them some more time to go through and add the stuff that I'm asking oh, for. We can like react, but then the expectation from the audience is when they demand something, they need it immediately, and they're like, "Why do you put it?" How do you guys as developers feel about that? And how do you try and manage those expectations? It is a balancing act, you know, depending on what it is we're trying to address. I mean, it can obviously take development time to get it right, right? You don't want to be too hasty to just rush, you know, change. This guy's full of it. Uh, like, he's not wrong. But, obviously, he's also not right. Why am I saying this? Well, does everyone remember when, well, uh, they increased the uh, the drop rate for Uber Uniques in all chests? And, uh, well, mainly, you know, the chests and all, and all the Helltide chests? Oh, well, you know, that, that had to be resolved in within two hours. Um, oh, we need a new, we need a gem stash tab? Oh, well, well you know, it's complicated, we'll regulate that, uh... The season three, um, you know, it takes a while to do these things. It's like, wait, wait, what is it? Because I feel that if you can do the, if the neg if the thing that's positive to the community, which was, you know, those uber uniques dropping from those chests was a positive for the community. Because I'm sure whoever was able to obtain those uber uniques are now having fun. Well, it's a positive for the community, but it's a negative for the devs, so they can do, they don't have, it's almost like a no-brainer, we're going to have to take it out, right, because, you know, and they should have literally almost zero existence in the game, so it was done within two hours, and so this kind of baffles the players, because then it's, you know, it's noticing that we're choosing and picking when when you can be effective and when you when you're not right because it's like it shows that oh well if it's a negative to the community well then we need to do it quickly we need to do it quickly oh well if it's a positive to the community all right well you know we'll take till season you know you know it's complicated it can get done in season three you know you know you know come on we have like three teams uh, it's hard here, so you know it's it's a little it's a little like confusing. It's like oh well you know all of a sudden the system comes out where you know you need there's the system we have to go through when we're making changes. It's like well what happened to this system? So does this system only work for selective things? Like so if it's a positive um, if the community thinks it's a it's a plus. It's a plus one, and you think it's a plus. It's a negative two. Then you have to you have to do this. You, you have to make sure that you can put this as a as a zero fast to get out of the negative, right? And that has to be done within that day. But if it's a it's a plus, if the community think it's a plus two, you have to make sure that shit goes back to zero. Right. Uh, well, if it's a, if it, if it, I mean, the potential 
of the of the thing can be a plus two. Well, you know, ah, it's complicated. It's gonna take it's gonna take months to do. Um, we have a cyst. All of a sudden, the system comes out of somewhere. I don't know. Uh, well, you know, that's what I mean, right? It's arbitrary. And I think that's what mostly the community is uh, is angry about. That's why I think it feels like we want you to be done immediately. And to be honest, we don't really care about the process. We could give two hell two shits less. What's the process? What we care is that we if we can have fun now, right? It's all immediate. So it, and we're not they're not asking you to have it in immediately either. We want you to do it within two weeks. One or two weeks, that's all they want you to do it with them. Instead, you're like, no, we can do it within three months. Or, no, we're going to have you wait six months. Or, no, we're going to have you wait nine months until we can give you this positive aspect of the game that you've been looking for. And so, what happens? If it doesn't get done within a two-week time period, people are going to stop playing the game. That's it. End of discussion. That's how it's going to be. So it's either you do it or you or, or you lose players. But I don't think the devs understand that. Instead, they they have these are these they have these ideas that we care that this there's a system <laughs> that they have to go through to make these changes. You may end up like imbalancing the game in a different way that you maybe didn't foresee. So you have to take your time to really think through, like, okay, how do we want to address the problem that's been flagged? How long do you have to take to think about this? It, does it really take three months to really think about that? To be honest, I think, you know, I propose the idea is that I'm sure what's happening is that they're splitting. They're sp yeah, yeah, they're not, they're not, they're splitting their workforce. And they're having one team work on these balancing patches that were working on future projects. Instead of stopping all work on future projects, you know, for Diablo 4, and dealing with that issue, that balance issue, right there and then, and having it be a two-week problem instead of a three-month problem. That they have to deal with. Because in three months, they're going to have three months worth of less players. So I, I don't understand that. And halting the project for maybe two weeks, well, it might hurt a lot. But, you know, it's not going to hurt as much as it would if they have to halt, um, if they have to, like, I don't know, slowly grind to it in three months. I'm unsure, you know. People in the comics can tell me if, if I'm wrong there or not. They even make it this far in the video. This video is already pretty damn long. Um, look at it in terms of priority as well. There's oftentimes competing priorities. So it's like making sure you're targeting the, the thing that's going to have the biggest impact for the player first and foremost. And then finding the right you know, time to release those things. <sighs> this is what I'm talking about. Because it's what, what they perceive to be the biggest deal and what, what is the biggest deal, right? Because it's like they don't, they're not actively playing the game, so they don't know what really is the biggest deal for the player. The player keeps telling them and they keep on ignoring it and saying, well, you know, maybe it's the, law, it's the, the minority that's the vocal, but that's speaking loud, so maybe we're not hearing. Maybe we're just hearing the minority speak, even though it's the majority that's telling them the issues. Um, but to be honest, I think they can pull up just a couple people's, vi uh, like three influencers' videos to figure out the core issues of Diablo 4 and the things they need to fix. And so it won't be like a, a three-month thing if they sit down and they figure that, you know, these things are reasonable. And maybe if we play the game and figure it out, and maybe we can fix this within two weeks. Or, or even a week, right? Because it's just changing numbers. 
changing values from 1 to 2 or 2 to 3 or 3 to 2. You know, it's not that hard. Just depends on how hard you want to make it. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's just really a balancing act that, you know, our, our leadership and our designers have to really kind of like work through for each issue as it comes through. Yeah, it's also complexity of the development process. You know, when we look at, we have essentially three teams working on the seasonal side. There's like, we have our odd teams, so like doing season one, then season three, then season five. We have our even teams doing season two, season four, and then we have another team that's focused on what's going on in the live game. And so on top of those three teams who are like, the odds and evens are leapfrogging each other. We've got our live team, and then we actually have an expansion team working as well. And so when we hear a piece of feedback, there's always the conversation, if we agree with it, then it's like, is this a short term? Hey, we can do that as a hot fix overnight. Is this more of a patch that has to come in two weeks? Or actually it's something we're gonna address next season because of the way that, you know, we're, we're a lot of the ways, that's part of the thing. Like when we put out season one, season one was finished when we released. And so there, there was no real player feedback yet, other than sort of the beta feedback. But, in, but after launch, like season one was kind of done. And so that's why we use that preseason time to tweak as much as we could. This is not a, this is not, what, what are, they, are they saying what I think they're saying? Well, we're kind of already, it's already kind of done. So, you know, we got to wait till next season to actually fix anything. Is that is that what I'm hearing? I I think that's what I'm hearing. I don't know. Maybe maybe I have selective hearing. Maybe other people are hearing differently. But that's what I'm hearing coming out of this guy's mouth. I don't like it. I feel that. Ah, uh, the word I feel. I think that they need to stop that like now. And instead, the live team needs to make the decision to patch whatever is patchable now. Not two weeks, not... No, no, not next season. Not season three. Not the season after that. Not the season after that. Wait. Now. Two weeks. Because the minute, because it's it's like I've said before, if you address things too late, it's already too late. People aren't going to come back. A lot of these people are just going to move on to the next game. I don't know why you feel. Why are we so arrogant? I'm not us, not me. You know, not us players. But why? Do I feel this like arrogance from the game designers or from the devs? What is there to be arrogant about? You can be proud that you've made this game and it's you know it's a good uh, well now it's it's been it's it's become trash because of you guys, but you know you have a good foundation here. A, f a good foundation can always be ruined through arrogance. And from what I hear you guys talking, it's arrogant. You've already finished this. Who the fuck cares? I don't care what you have to say. We'll deal with it later. That's how that's how it feels that you, you guys are talking to us. I don't know. That's that's how I feel. That sounds, you know, it's like ah oh, well, where it's already done. Who cares what you have to say? We're thinking about like the future, so we're gonna patch it however we want, and we're gonna deal with it however we want. Oh, well, you don't want to wait? Well, yeah, who cares? Ah, tough luck. That's how it sounds. Uh, they're going to lose a lot of players. Well, uh, they already have. With this thought process. This thought process is not the winning thought process. If they, if they use this thought process on anything else, they would have lost. <laughs> you try to build a basketball team off of this thought process. Try to to make a chess team off of this thought process, you would have lost. Could and 
why we yeah that's why i'm saying i'm giving it to season three in my opinion because season one was basically ready to be shipped on launch of the game they had to have that in the back log basically the by themselves development time for all of this stuff post launch so season two we give things like fixes to resistance and and the in-game content additions and then by season three in my opinion which i know it's it's like nine months after the launch of the game could have had baby by now but basically when season three comes out that is like they had season two to develop season three and season one gave them the time to fix all of the issues so by season two the issues should be fixed and in game should be added and by season three that's when the first real major season should happen so i'm giving it till then and then i've said many times if by season three i'm not feeling it then i'm just done with diablo 4 basically and i'm going to move on to just full-time variety stuff but I, I'm willing to give it to season three. I know not everyone's going to be willing to. I know people are going to call it copium and all that, but I'm willing to give it to season three to see how the game shakes out because I actually believe what Rod's saying. Like, I, I, I know season one was ready on development. Season two, they're probably trying to cram in as many fixes as they possibly can for all the stuff people are complaining about and add some in-game. And then, in my opinion, season three is really when they got... That's that's their that's their shot. That's their one we, chance. You know, remove the need for the altars of Lilith and that kind of thing. So it's just that notion that... They, the trains are always running, right? The trains are always leaving the station. And what can get on at which train is always part of the balancing act of like, oh yeah, we agree with that feedback. Now which train can we actually make it on? And are we willing to delay other things to make that happen? Because I think sometimes people just feel like it's always additive. And really it's kind of like, there's only so much scope that a team can do. And so to say like, oh, this new idea wants to come in. Well then that means usually another idea needs to get postponed. And so when we're talking about the prioritization is like, oh, we want to do this. Are we willing to slow down this other thing? You know, and so that's, that's definitely one of the things, the give and takes you have to do when you're balancing. I don't want to say misunderstanding, but a lot of uh, the kind of discussion is also attributed to things like the battle pass system and the season model as well. And some people say, oh, it doesn't feel like it works. In I don't know anymore. These guys kind of give the same answers. In, in Diablo, I mean, we've had other people who uh, make games similarly, like the Path of Exile, keep looking at it and be like, we're learning a lot from the viability of something like a battle pass model. How often do you kind of like reassess that? And I'll be honest, I'm so over the conversation about battle pass. I don't actually think the battle pass is a big deal at all. I think that it's it's completely free you don't have to buy it the buying it's just cosmetics the the ashes give you like a 12 percent experience boost which you can't even pay for anyway it's only from the free portion of it you're not going to uh outpace uh the purchasable portion of it so therefore there's no pay to win at all people are still complaining about the battle pass i understand the argument of it's a 70 dollars game and they're also selling microtransactions i don't care if you sell cosmetics i don't care in any game if you sell cosmetics it doesn't bother me if they want to make more money by selling cosmetics as long as there are still good looking models in the game and the cosmetics aren't the only good looking models so you're basically paywalled to look like a clown unless you actually have good cosmetics I'm perfectly fine with cosmetics. I'm over people asking questions about this. Do you think it does? I agree. Who cares? Like, really, grow up. There's battle passes in all the damn games now. Get used to it. All right, let's let's continue. Still work in this day and age, um, especially because there's like a lot of cosmetic stuff, and you don't want to upset the balance. And when it is like you can't put a lot of meaningfully changing content in there. Is it even worth doing? How do you approach like looking at that kind of system? I think that's what we're learning now. Like, you know, that's like one of the things is like, we're having lots of conversation about the first time we've done something, you know? And so in times we'll, we'll come together and we'll go like, hey everybody, this is one data point, you know? And like, and we're looking at season one and like, what's the battle pass doing? What's the shop doing? What is the seasonal reset doing? How do we feel about it? And it's like, at the end of the day, it's one data point. And so I'm really excited for season two on October 17th because that's now we'll have two data points to go like, okay, how many people are playing? How many people are engaging with Battle Pass and Shop? How's it all working? And so I think this is all learning for us. Like I know people tend to think like, oh, you had 10 years with Diablo 3, you must know everything. And the answer is very different games, very different team. And so we're, and, and obviously the industry has changed in the last 10 years. So for us, it's really, this is a lot of learning for us. So we're gonna, you know, make I agree that the industry has changed, but I'm like, if does the, does none of the knowledge that comes from making Diablo three and those teams not leave books and stuff like that for you guys? Because you know you would think that after you make a game, 
Because it's like they have the the they should have the design document for that game for Diablo three before even attempting to make Diablo four. I would have every team study that like the Bible and 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 say and like have a list. Here are all the mistakes that we made in the previous game. Let's make sure that we don't make the same mistakes. Oh, by the way, we have devlogs about that game. There. Oh, all the mistakes, the reason, and, and the numbers, the graphs. It's like, well, shouldn't you have all this data? Like, <laughs> you know, I would think you'd have all this data, right? And and make sure that the people who, who are going to design Diablo 4 are studying this, this data pretty, you know, religiously. So they don't make the same mistakes. We don't need the same mistakes that were made in the past to happen in the future. That's why the mistakes in the past should stay in the past. Of course, you know, I feel I, I, it's probably I'm being unrealistic here. Uh, how can someone go through all that data? You know, well, you know, I'm just saying, you know, they give them a start. Uh, um, you know. Because you know they have to pick. I, I think they have to. They have to choose these projects, and then these projects also have to get uh, greenlit, right? So then I'm sure this takes a while for those projects to get greenlit. So I, I think you know they should be on their downtime instead of actually having their downtime. They can go ahead and they can study for the next game because I'm like <laughs> that's all they really do, right? They make games all the time, and I'm like. Uh, you know, I'd rather them be doing that, right? Uh, you're you're studying, so now you have a reason to why the the, the game is so shitty, right? Because <laughs> uh, you know, oh, we were studying the pamphlet of Diablo three, the game design do document for that. And by the way, the game design document is just an outline for game designers on how the process. Uh, uh, the processes that will be taken to make um, these games, concepts, the um, uh, how, how to say the inspirations that we take from, you know, things like that. That that's what the game design document has. Um, also, uh, the metadata. It, it's stuff like that that the game design document has that could be helpful. Um, for future projects, I don't know. Um, maybe maybe I'm just speaking delusion, and I'm not saying anything that makes any sense. But uh, I feel that studying things from the past that we've already done in this studio to not make the same mistakes again sounds, you know, better making the same mistakes again, and, well, we're going to make it, we're going to have, this is going to be a learning process. It's like, I think, I think, um, that's how we're going to lose players instead of gain more, because no one wants to sit through the learning process with you and have a hard time. Uh, at least, you know, the players don't. The players don't. Of course, you know, they're going to be a small subset of players, you know, around 2K players that do want to, but, you know, I don't, I don't, really. It's mistakes as we're trying to make the game better and better. Yeah. Do you think there's kind of like a different expectation on a team like the Diablo team or even a, a developer like Blizzard? Yeah, because obviously you're seen as one of the biggest developers in the world. But the thing I see where he's going with this question. So basically, it's like, are Blizzard held to a different standard? I think Blizzard is always going to take PRLs almost no matter what they do. That's yeah, not that's saying true. that it's impossible for them to take a W, but for the most part, like, they're going to get roasted. Blizzard has been giving um, negative, negative, negative PR kind of continually. Uh, there's entire channels dedicated to just talking about how evil <laughs> Blizzard is, etc. It's... I try to give balance takes, but look, even if I come out here and be like, there's things I like about Blizzard, things I don't like, just saying there's things I do like, like it's enough to get me targeted by these types of people. So um, Blizzard seems to be in a position where they almost can't win no matter what they do. Now, I know some people will respond by saying, well, just make a good game. If Diablo 4 was good, you know, be universally praised and all that. Ah, uh, sure, there's probably some truth to 
to if they made the game better, it wouldn't be received as negatively. But it's it's it, when's the last time you guys have seen some positive Blizzard headlines? I mean, they, these guys managing PR have got to be some of the most stressful positions in gaming in the world right now. They just get oh. roasted in the ground continually. I agree with that. That probably is true. Probably super stressful to be in these positions. Look at these guys are already sweating. You can see it. Uh, <laughs> this guy's already sweating. We we know this. Uh, the thing is, is that I disagree. If they make a good game, it's the game will defend itself. Look at Elden Ring. Look at Armored Core Six. Look, these games will defend themselves if you make good games. All we care about is good games, and that's it. You wouldn't even see videos from some guy like me if they made a good game. And, you know, I had a necromancer with actual minions. Cool looking ones. Like a death knight. You know, I might, uh, at this point I might make a damn separate video about how, I, how much I hate the necromancer. And how much I think the necromancer has been neglected. Producing is still quite new to you. Oh, there's the expectation. Well, this is Blizzard. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be allowed to stumble or able to stumble. They should know this stuff. Like, how do you kind of like approach that sentiment, knowing that there's no like pushing back against it? I. I mean, I, I think it's just impossible like, question to we're answer. We're all kind of just working our way through it. It's like there's sure we have a lot of benefits of being part of Blizzard, and we had a lot of learnings, and we we're able to talk to each other and understand what's going on at WoW and what's going on in Overwatch and we can you know, talk to each other, but at the end of the day, this team is like d doing a live service like this is new for this team. And even, you know, we have some D3 veterans and things, but a lot of our team, like there's a good part of our team where Diablo 4, we were at the launch party where I was like, how many people, this is your first game ever? And like a bunch of hands go up and you're like, Not, you know, this is the very first game they've ever shipped. Is okay, this, this opens a lot more eyes than, this, this makes much more sense. Then, if Diablo 4 is the first game they've ever shipped, what what happened to the D3 veterans? What the hell were they doing? These guys should have been studying up. Well. Well, well, well. How can you expect a good job from a first timer? We all know. We all know first timers are always gonna mess up. So, I, you know, I feel that this is used, is gonna be used as an excuse for all for all the failures that happen. Um, and for first timers, you know, this is pretty good. But uh. I have I have a feeling, you know, that they did enough of their studying, you know, the proper they went proper works, and they still had a lot of uh, hiccups. And even if this this is their first game, like, what the heck is up with all the ideas? I think that's what we have a lot of problems with, like uh, the conceptions for a lot of these characters, a lot of their builds. Is I, I feel that it's uh, boring. It's really boring. Not a lot of options. And I think that's the main issue. That we need to figure out fast. How to, diverse, how to diversify more character growth. More character style of play. How to make um, builds um, better. How to make uh, more faithful characters. Uh, faithful and lower friendly characters you know I don't know this, this, is, this is just what I'm thinking right because you know when you ever think of, barbar of a barbarian you, you think of you know a big muscle headed guy who's just he's the he's the attack dealer of the team right you think about a necromancer you're thinking about supportive supportive buffs you know he's like an undead cleric who can also summon minions.
that's what I think, you know. Um, you know, someone who has abilities that can heal his minions and possibly raise higher, uh, like mid to high tier minions, you know, instead of this skeleton mage, skeleton warrior garbage, you know. Uh, I don't know. Um, that's my 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 idea, right? Because this this shouldn't be this should be their first live service game, possibly. But I, I hope it's not their first game game, right? Like the first game they've ever designed. Because I think that's what probably what you meant when you said that. Diablo 4, and so there's definitely like the combination of experience and the ability to access Blizzard, but like we're still going to learn as we go, and so yeah, I mean, I think I get the, hey, you're Blizzard, you, sh you should never make a mistake, but at the same time, like, again, the industry is always changing, the games are always changing, the players are always changing, so it's just going to be learning as we go, and that's why what I love about a live service is we can evolve over time, it's not a fix. I don't know about the players. I don't think the players are always changing. I think for certain mediums of games, there will always be this type of play, this certain this type of player base that we see now, and those player bases will be divided into three categories. We'll have the casuals, the mid to level casuals, and then we'll have the tryhards. Right? I think of myself as a mid uh, level casual. I like if I had the time, I'd play the games all the time, but I don't. I play them all weekend though. Uh, casuals won't. That's the difference. I will have, like, I have like two hundred and something hours in Elden Ring. Um, might be four hundred now, but you know, I played the hell out of that that game. I played it for two weeks straight. It was great. I had a great time. And and that's the thing. I loved El uh, I, since I played Elden Ring, I loved Armored Core as well. I loved Dark Souls 1 3. We don't talk about 2. Um and and so it's like I don't I don't really think like the players really change that much. Or as much as you, you're you're claiming that they do, I, I think there there's uh there's an opening for a new audience of players, but they're they're pretty much uh, uh a a a just it, it's like a uh, a avalanche of casuals, because the game you're making is for uh is for a casual audience yes, but you also do want to make sure that it appeals to the hardcore. Um, one percenters, and you should also, I think, incorporate the gameplay to be acceptable for mid core, mid level. Um, that's I call them mid core players, right? Because we're kind of in the middle. It's like they they can be hardcore if they had the time. Um, they're hardcore on weekends and they're casual on weekdays. That's how it is. Uh, you know, for people who have jobs, it's how it is. Um, so yeah. Now, this is almost ending. Um, it's probably going to be one of the longest videos. I don't know if this is going to be a lot of... Re Maybe I need to figure out how to make it, like, 27 minutes. Like, like, uh, like, DM. Is... <laughs> Look at this. It's already an hour long, and, uh, we have, um, a couple minutes left. Two more. State. There are almost so one more minute left. season, and we're going to support the game for years to come, is that we can evolve and learn as we go. I think what's fascinating about that is because we it's have a hard a question like to answer. You guys where you're, you very much are like figuring it out as you go along to a degree, and it's kind of like the expectation is why. You I want to point out one thing too. Like I actually like that he's doing a surprising amount of admitting. Like, well, we're just figuring it out. Like, you know, we made some mistakes. We're trying. Like, I, I love to see it when they when when people are willing to admit. Um, you know, we're trying, you know what I mean? Like so often there's a lot of, I feel like BS of like, oh no, like it's, it's the, you know, why like, I thought they were going down with the vocal minority thing. Like I thought they just like blame the players, blame the audience. Like it's not, but you know, to his credit, uh, you know, Rod's credit here, he, he's kind of dealing, well, we're trying, you know, he's saying they're trying, they're going to try to figure it out, et cetera, which regardless how you feel about me, I like that. At least. We should have the perfect product each time. And it's
I agree with that. Being honest is always the best thing, I think. I think if you're honest, that's good. Um, but of course, remember, honesty can also be dangerous. But do not allow that, don't allow that danger to dissuade you from being honest. Because in that honesty, you've, now we know that, you know, there's a new team, so now... I don't know really how to how to have my expectations. Maybe I should just not have any, just so that you know I uh, I can get what I uh, um what I, I get what I deserve for paying and 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 experiencing this game with you <laughs> with the developers, right? <laughs> kind of. Because to be honest, I feel it's not a fair trade, right? It's like you're you, um oh this is everyone's first game um. Uh, what about the players? Oh, you know, who cares? We're all learning, right? Uh, let let them feel a little bit of the pain. It's not thought of as great, but then on the flip side, you have a team like Larian, which just put out one of the best RPGs in a long time, but it was... Yeah, you see how the way he started looking at them, he's like, why the hell you have to mention them? Why? Why did you mention them? Out of anyone else you could have mentioned... Why did you mention them? Oh, this is good. Uh, I feel I can already feel the drama emanating from their eyes. The the pure hate because of how good uh, freaking Baldur's Gate 3 is. <laughs> Developed over three years of iterating very publicly forward facing and people are celebrating that right now. It must be... He's like, how do I resist punching this guy in the face? You see this face, guy? The the facial expression of this guy right here. He's like, how do I resist punching this guy in the face? And this guy's like, I'm disappointed you even asked that question. <laughs> oh god, the, the, the jealousy emanates so thickly from both. It's kind of wild to be in an industry where... You can have two contradicting kind of like narratives on the same thing going and like how do you deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis as developers? Uh, they all have that. I mean, I'm just really happy that the, the, this feels like the year of the RPG, you know, and you know, like at Starfield and Final Fantasy and Hogwarts, like it, oh, and all the stuff yeah. that's going on. So I'm just excited to be part of that. And I think they each have their own place when you think about like the turn-based versus the hack and slash versus, you know, the third person versus isometric. Like I think it's really cool that the RPGs can have such a diversity and, and so I don't know I don't I just think it's great that RPGs is really coming to the top this year all right so this one if you want to watch this without my commentary I'll have a link down below that's on GameSpot there but uh you know surprising amount of admittance of uh you know working it out as they go I actually really like seeing that type of stuff all right yeah. I want to talk oh this was shared on the game yeah that's good um uh, you tell me if you like if I uh, like me doing this type of stuff. I think I think I did so much better in this one than I did my last that Forspoken one. I had more to talk about here, and I actually, as a player of this game, I had a lot of input to you know give to give. So you tell me if you really liked it. Um, I'm just going to upload it the way I did. I did it on my first take. I'm not not. I hate doing like second or third takes stuff so yeah <clears throat> oh, yeah you tell me how you like it uh all right that's uh it's admiral i'm gonna be out